Hello, everybody. Um, hope you can hear me. Hope you're all in. Welcome to uh, our latest Alborada online events. This is our sixth event. Um, we only started doing them when when online events became the new reality of of kind of uh, having any kind of interaction with other people. So um, they've been a big success so far. Really good to see so much interest in today's event. I'm really pleased that uh, so many people have been able to join. Um, before I introduce all our speakers, um, my name is Nick McWilliam. I'm a co-editor at Alborada. Um, Alborada, uh, as if you've attended any of our events, um, physical events or online, uh, Alborada is an independent voice on Latin American politics, media and culture. Uh, we provide a progressive take on the region, offering perspectives rarely found in the mainstream. So I'm sure there'll be plenty of opportunity to um, talk more about what we do and, and um, various other independent media out there. Um, a few items of housekeeping before we get into it. Um, we recently released a digital magazine, um, which you can get for free. I will be posting that in the chat. All you have to do is just drop us an email and we will happily send that to you. So please do get that if you haven't already got it. Also, we have a crowdfunder, which I will post as well in the chat. We're currently at 25% of our target. So massive, massive thanks to everybody who has contributed, to everybody who has supported us uh, by coming to these events, by sharing what we do. Um, and also, of course, you know, we do need resources, material resources to keep these things going. And we would very much like to keep doing that. So please do support us and do share our crowdfunder around uh, with other people who might be interested. As I said, I'll be putting the link in the chat. So that brings us on to today's uh, presentation, today's talk, and very, very happy uh, to be joined by four journalists. Four, um, it was announced as having three, but we're very happy to have had a fourth person step up uh, to join us. So lots to get through. So I will aim to move ahead reasonably quickly. Um, our first speaker, we have Matt Kennard, um, a journalist, uh, author, um, we are also joined by Camila Escalante, um, who, another journalist who's currently based in Latin America, uh, working uh, with different media outlets. I'll give you a bit more information about each speaker as and when um, they, it comes to their turn to, to speak in more detail. Um, and massive thanks as well to John McAvoy, who has joined us at the last minute. John is an independent journalist who has also done a lot on the region. And our fourth speaker will be Pablo Navarretti, um, founder and co-editor uh, with me of Al Barada. Um, so as you are aware, this event looks at how the media reports on the region. So some of the core areas that we will address, no doubt, uh, will things about, you know, how much can we rely on what we're told by Latin, um, what we're told by the media about Latin America, where can we go to get this reliable information, uh, how does the media report on Latin America? Why does the media report in the way it does? And what are the implications of this? So I'm very much hopeful that our, um, that our speakers will clear up some of these things and you know, they all have experienced a long, long experience of working uh, with the region. So uh, no doubt there will be lots of interesting points covered. Um, afterwards, we have a Q&A session uh, where well, you will have an opportunity to speak, to, to ask questions to the entire panel or to somebody in particular. Uh, if you're a particular person, please specify. Um, if you want to ask a question, please write it in the chat, uh, which is there, you know, you should be able to see it. And also, uh, you are able to ask the question yourself. So please, please specify if you would like to ask the question yourself when you write it in the chat and we will get the camera on you when the question comes to you. Uh, bear in mind that we are filming this and we will release it afterwards. So if you do ask a question, you will be on film uh, and that will go out. So just bear that in mind. Uh, or, alternatively, I can ask the question. I can read it if you'd prefer me to do that. So um, I believe that is the main uh, housekeeping issues. Uh, yes, okay, just remember, yeah, have a really good event. Really, really happy to be here. It's a beautiful evening in North London and. Hopefully it's very nice where you guys all are as well. So yeah, really looking forward to it. So without further ado, I'm going to introduce our first speaker properly. Mentioned him already. Uh, a long time friend of Alborada um, is Matt Kennard. Uh, Matt is a journalist and the author of two books, Irregular Army and The Racket, 
he is also a co-founder of Declassified UK, uh, which aims to uncover the UK's real role in the world uh, and provide public service journalism investigating UK foreign, military and intelligence policies. Matt has uh, spent several years working closely with Latin America. So please, Matt, over to you. Okay, well, um, yeah, thanks for the introduction and hello, everyone. Um, I guess I'll start by just what I could offer is a kind of corporate media view of Latin America because um, soon after I came out of journalism school, um, I went to work for the Financial Times and then worked uh, not as, as a staffer, but worked quite a lot with The Guardian after that. So I was in the belly of the beast for a while. So I, I can discuss a little bit about that, which might give people um, a, a view that you don't often get. Because as we know, most of the people that are inside the corporate media don't talk it down because they want to take, they want to re remain in their jobs. So basically the top line is everything you think about the corporate media and how it runs and how it spreads misinformation and disinformation about Latin America is true. And in fact, its role is to do that because Latin America in recent history, as we all know, has been one of the, well, the place really for really hopeful progressive movements to arise from Bolivia to Venezuela to Nicaragua to Mexico. I mean, all over the continent, it's really the home of the left in terms of uh, planet Earth. So obviously a corporate media, which is set up to destroy um, progressive movements, or at least uh, echo states which, which are set up to, the, which go out to destroy progressive um, movements. Um, are not going to be kind to those kind of uh, progressions. And in fact, I started working in the corporate media around 2008. Um, I, I, I was working in New York for the, the New York Post. I'm not proud of that. But then I went on to work for the Financial Times a few years after that. So it was at the height of the war on terror. And in fact, what you saw at that point was that Latin America got away or progressive movements in Latin America and progressive governments got away with doing good things for quite a while because the US was so focused on destroying Iraq uh, and Afghanistan and, and now and then after that plenty of other places in the Middle East and so much of the national security state the US military was focused on that conflict that they kind of took their foot off uh, Latin America for once uh, and obviously there was the coup in 2002 against Chavez which was backed um, by the Bush administration organized by the Bush administration. But in fact, they I, I don't think that the, the pink tide could have happened um, if the war on terror hadn't happened as well and kind of diverted US resources because obviously part of the whole um, history of US imperialism is to destroy progressive movements early on. So they can't set an example to the rest of the world of what a civilized society can look like. And they, I mean, the whole history is littered with examples of, of that so but they didn't get to do it this time around i mean they're doing it now they're kind of making up for lost time but um in the 2000s we saw progressive movements all over latin america um uh really rising up and so at the financial times i did not have a different political outlook to what i have now but after i left journalism school and we can talk about this later but one of the problems is is if you're a critically minded anti-imperialist journalist and you want to have a career or you want to have a, a, an income, you want to have a, a normal life, there's very few places for you to go. So you kind of have to go into the system and that's how they capture a lot of people. I resisted that uh, to a certain degree and, and, and never really wanted to stay in it, but that was why I initially went into the Financial Times. Uh, so while I was there, I used um, the many, many benefits you have of working for the Financial Times, which is you have access to all the power players. And they're very candid with you because they believe that you are one of them. So um, you, can go, you can go to a, a country like Bolivia or Brazil or Argentina or Haiti and instantly get on the phone or have an in-person meeting with the US ambassador, for example, or the head of the World Bank in, 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 that, uh, in that country. So it was very eye-opening from that from that point of view. And of course, the stories I was writing for the Financial Times weren't ones that you'd see in Alborada or other, uh, or other places, uh, alternative media outlets. But um, what I did was gather the information that I could and get the testimony from, from these people that I knew I'd never have access to again and kind of used it subsequently. To, to My second book was called The Racket and it kind of filled in the blanks that you're not allowed to say in the corporate media using their own words. 
Um, and and my, my experience really just showed that there is a whole edifice um, set up by the US, but also other uh, Western powers to control Latin America. And I call it the empire of acronyms, you know, it's like D -E -U, there's certain, in every one of these capitals, or especially the smaller ones, there's, there's usually a big like skyscraper that you go into the lobby and then on the, on the board will be DEA, um, uh, USAID, NED, there's, there's all these acronyms that are just, that are obviously presented to the public and will come onto the media's role, but at, through the media as presented to the public as these democracy promotion, uh, human rights um, organizations. But in fact, of course, they're all about control and about maintaining a certain system that benefits US corporations and Western corporations, but also uh, ensures that government, liberation governments can't rise up that will take on the United States. Um, so my time at the Financial Times really just just confirmed what I what I believed about how the system worked uh, before I went in. Uh, and I think that the media, I talked about the, uh, the empire of acronyms, the media is a, is a, is a, is the most important player because they create the hyper reality that the populations of the Western world uh, mostly believe and they're, they're completely divorced from reality. So they target countries that, that do things that, 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 that the powers that be don't like. So for example, we did a, we did a story in um, El Salvador about this system called the investor state dispute system which is a kind of obscure system, which shouldn't be obscure, but is a system whereby corporations can sue states that do things they don't like. So if a state raises the minimum wage, if the state um, cancels a mining contract, these companies through the World Bank, and there's other forums as well, but primarily through the World Bank and a body called ICSID can take these um, uh, uh, countries to, uh, to, to this court and, and win billions of dollars in payouts. And in fact, in El Salvador, this was happening um, uh, with a mining company and we went there to investigate that. And, and, and I, I'm telling this story because this was a story we did for The Guardian. And I've, uh, the, the Financial Times, you kind of obviously works for the corporate elite and, and in fact, you're writing for the corporate elite of the Western world. But The Guardian presents itself as a, um, a progressive uh, uh, newspaper on the left. But we, we found that... Uh, after we published the story about these, these about this this system, and about also about another, we did another story about peasants that were sitting on top of an aquifer that all the water was getting siphoned off by corporations. They they opened up their their pages to the Latin America chief of Sab Miller, which is the bottling company which we exposed uh, a couple of weeks later to just nine hundred words that he just spouted off all the, the usual corporate um, uh, talking points to defend what his company was doing. So. We have when you when you are a liberation government, you have all these forces ranged against you. It's in, and we see it now with Venezuela. We saw it with Bolivia. We saw it with Ecuador. There is a whole system that just comes and attacks you. And the media is the most important part of it because the media, in theory, is meant to get under and, and analyze the propaganda that is put about by states. But of course, it's an echo chamber, so it creates this whole. Um, as I mentioned, hyper reality about about how the world works, and it makes it it's so it's so hard to to go up against that. And you see it in Venezuela now. I mean, with the recent crisis there, the the, the coverage. I mean, even even if you don't like the government there, the coverage was so one sided and so ridiculous that it, it's impossible for for people to know what the hell is going on. And then you have these um, mercenaries from the US coming and attacking. Uh, uh, Venezuela and, and the Trump administration literally ha having a war, of, a war of terrorism on the country and it's not, it's not covered in those terms. This, 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 this should be an outrage, an international outrage, it's banditry, but it's not covered like that. So I think that it's more subtle in the Western world and, and obviously the FT, it's not, it's not like Soviet Russia, they're not telling you what to say, but it's a process of assimilation whereby people slowly sh shave off their edges or if they have any political outlet they slowly become part of the system and slowly stop saying things that are outside of the uh, accepted um ideology of the paper or, or of the media um and then you just had this it's a pretty much it's a it's a it's a monolith in the western world the media and i don't think there's any 
um, Western outlets which cover Latin America in it, it, properly, to be honest with you. And I, th I, th um, I think that the real hope we have is alternative media. And uh, I mean, it's hard, we're up against it, but of course we're up against it because there's hardly any interests which wanna fund it because most of the interests that have money are the ones that benefit from the system. So, um, but this is, a, this is something that's starting up now and we have Telezor and, and there's, there's, there's other grassroots media organizations coming up and that's actually quite a lot of exciting stuff happening in the UK, uh, including Alvarado and Declassify, which we've set up, which, which wants to cover the Western, what, what, Western imperialism in a critical way, which just doesn't happen at all. Excellent, Matt. Thank you very much for that um, really fascinating contribution. Uh, of course, the, your reference to the mercenaries um, attacking Venezuela was the event a couple of months ago when um, boatloads, I think it was a couple of boatloads of, of heavily armed uh, former soldiers from the US uh, arrived on the northern coast of Venezuela, were immediately picked up um, by security forces. It was actually a fisherman's militia, which was the first to intercept them. And, um, but yeah, it gives, a, gives an example of, of course, what Venezuela has been up against um, militarily and in terms of destabilization, but which is massively legitimized by a media. And just off the top of my head, thinking last year, sort of concerts on the border organized by Richard Branson on the Colombian side of the border, um, a, a bridge that had not actually opened um, was uh, routinely reported in the Western media or the Northern media, how we want to refer to it, as Maduro preventing humanitarian aid from coming into the country um, when in fact it hadn't opened and actually US and Colombian forces were in effect attempting, attempting to invade. So yeah, another example there, I mean, Venezuela's, you know, uh, 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 just one case. So with that, I'd like to introduce our next speaker. Uh, really, really happy to have her here. Uh, Camila Escalante is based in Quito, where she works as a TV news producer and presenter at Telesur English, and also works at Calsachan News in Bolivia, which is the recently launched English language service of Radio Calsachan Coca, which is the official news outlet of the six federations of the Tropico, better known as the Cocalero Campesino, organized mass bases. Mass, of course, being the uh, political party of Evo Morales. Camila also reports independently following the developments in Ecuador and struggles against neoliberalism and is most known for covering Venezuela. So Camila, uh, welcome to uh, the events. Hey guys, thanks for having me. Confirm with me that you can hear me. We can hear you very well. Okay, perfect. So um, I do want to say that one of my first encounters with um, El Barada and also Pablo Navaretti, who is now my colleague with Telestar English, was through um, uh, some coverage that you guys did in 2017 on Venezuela when the uh, destabilization uh, protests, which were of course largely coordinated, coordinated between like the mainstream corporate media, the foreign press, and you know the opposition leaders and the paid guarimbas, um, all of that was going on. So it was April 2017. You guys had a really good event where Pablo took us through um, everything that had happened um, with the National Assembly and, um, and kind of spoke about the different issues, including like the sanctions uh, and things that people were not really hearing a lot about at that time. And so at that time, really, some of the best coverage we had was coming from, I guess, Alvarada and um, and Pablo, and also from Venezuela Analysis, as always. And um, Telesur was covering um, and had, at, at one point, Abby and Mike go on the ground and kind of gave that like a big uh, push and a platform, which Venezuela wouldn't have had before, but um, kind of explaining those things step for step um, so knowledgeably is like, you know, something I've tried to apply within Telesur covering Venezuela. So um, I guess I just want to talk a little bit about, you know, my experience at Telesur English and of course talk about our project, Casachuan Coca, which is an extension of um, Radio Casachuan um, Coca, which is, um, you know, the, the original Spanish news outlet of the six federations there in Bolivia. So working among other media workers at my day job and other places, um, you know, where we're doing similar 
work, it becomes apparent that there are some people who've been more involved in social movements and working closely with communities. And then there are also people who kind of defend their journalistic practices on the basis that, you know, they spend a large sum of money to go to these prestigious um, university programs. And of course, there's some crossover, but, um, you know, I think it's really important, um, you know, to make sure that that we're not just parachuting into a country or situation or a community for a season or for a limited period of time. And we can't just be covering events kind of on a one-off basis and not part of a larger, um, you know, incorporating the larger context. So this is in part why at Telesur English I've been, you know, trying really hard to focus on covering Venezuela and covering those things um, that, that you guys covered in that event, which is explaining, you know, the different contexts, why the PSUV is such an important entity, what it is that, you know, ties these government leaders um, to the grassroots and some of the projects that are going on on the ground all the time. That's really important. And unfortunately, in the mainstream media, what makes the coverage so faulty is not just the is not just the you know CIA State Department lines editorial lines. It's that they're not covering Venezuela on an ongoing basis. It's that um, there are a lot of government programs that um, can be you know in the case of El Salvador recently, all of a sudden all these media outlets in the United States and all these people on Twitter began talking about how great Nayib Bukele is. For, um, for all of a sudden coming up with these last minute social programs amid the COVID-19 pandemic, while at the same time, not taking note of the fact that uh, the, the Bolivarian government under President Nicolas Maduro has put forth initiatives like this all year round, and particularly because the country is under you know, a course of measures and the ongoing US blockade. And so obviously when, when those media outlets began to talk about El Salvador, they weren't talking about um, you know, some of the awful things that have taken place following um, you know, a period of governance by the FMLN um, and the fact that this new government in El Salvador is driving the country towards neoliberalism. And of course now people are denouncing Nayib Bukele because people are not receiving the money that they were promised because you know people are um, you know falling into a very bad economic situation, and this man has only been in government in power for one year, so that context would have been very helpful. Um, so um, I think part of why we need to be con continuously covering these things in detail is, of course, because we need to be covering this process, which is uh, you know an ongoing imperialist war on our continent on an ongoing basis. We need to be covering the coup before it happens. In the case of Venezuela, in the case of Nicaragua, we need to be covering um, these things that are happening before they actually take place. And we should have been doing that in Bolivia rather than showing up and screaming on the internet on November 10th of 2019 when it was too late. So that was kind of the idea behind Kasashwan News. We tried to bring in coverage to tell us English on our From the South newscast, um, where I'm a producer, and tried to cover the coup process which was taking place over a period of months. And so last year we saw a lot of people kind of rally around this issue of the fires in Bolivia and blame the government of Evo Morales for that. Um, we also you know, saw just different claims from these uh, these different groups, which are not progressive groups, they're not left-wing groups, and they're not part of any real social movement, but they were making claims that Evo Morales was no longer representative of the indigenous people, of the popular movements, of the social movements, which is absolutely ridiculous because these are, of course, groups which are, um, you know, funded externally and through um, NGOs that are, you know, Washington-based, essentially. And so um, through bringing Ollie, Ollie Vargas, my colleague, onto um, some of our programs and uh, using him as a source, we were able to cover Bolivia much more extensively. And, um, but we were trying to, you know, we were barely doing these issues any justice with limited time and limited airtime. And um, the only way to cover these 
um, these issues was really to be on the ground. And so that led me to going to Bolivia as the coup took place on my own initiative. I took my annual leave and flew there. And while I was there, I did report for and contribute to Mint Press News and for Telser English, of course. Um, but that was something that I felt like I needed to shed light on uh, for the English speaking world, because of course, for Bolivia, we've always been translating things from Spanish. Um, there, there was almost no coverage of Bolivia uh, before the coup in English. And we also didn't want, I didn't want any of these events that were taking place to be watered down. So that's the reason why I went. And so um, I think like one of the things that has been really important to talk about with Bolivia is the way in which the mass party is completely embedded in the country's social movements and that makes the party unique. It makes the situation of the left in Bolivia unique as in the in Brazil with the PT as in the Sandinistas and similar to obviously um, the PSUP and in Venezuela and that the you know we want to show in Kausashwa News that the 14 years of the movement towards socialism in government has resulted in substantial gains uh, for the Bolivian people and we also want to allow them to be able to speak for themselves and so we launched Kausashwa News in the middle of this you know, very strict state of exception uh, here where I am, and of course the lockdown there in Bolivia. And so, you know, a lot of the things that we've wanted to do have been postponed, but it's something that we fully want to launch um, going forward and be able to get people to send materials on the ground to be able to speak for themselves. And what someone like I can do is provide translation and to be able to subtitle things and to give things a bit more of a platform. And so as soon as, you know, things kind of loosen up and relax in terms of like the regulations, um, we want to be able to, you know, go full speed ahead with that. And, you know, some of the things that have happened in Bolivia are happening in many other countries have happened before with the United States and right wing forces attempting uh, to overthrow governments and to sneak their way in there through NGOs and through these, um, these different, these different, uh, you know, right wing figures. So I did come up with a, like a short list of topics that somebody could investigate if they're not on the ground, because I think that um, it's really important that we give people the tools to report on the ground, to be able to allow people who are already on the ground to have a voice and, and all of that stuff. But obviously I'm speaking to people who are in the UK. And so I think that the work that different outlets do which are not here in Latin America is very um, it's very important but it's going to look different at times and so I think um, personally some things that I've seen I mean people do spend a lot of time writing these articles for outlets that pay $150 or what have you maybe that's high for you maybe it's low but a, a great deal of money for articles on Latin America and these are I mean a lot of times people have spent a great deal of time outside of Latin America. And so what are you really reporting on? Well, there are still things that you can contribute. So one of the things that, I, that has been, um, you know, on the top of my mind has been me to be looking at the, the activities that the DEA, the US Drug Enforcement Agency has been doing here in the Americas. Specifically, we need to look at what the DEA, had, what kind of role it has had in Colombia and the ties to the government and the different institutions there, as well as to the paramilitaries and what the military knows. And those who, um, and, and the way in which, you know, the operations that the DEA is connected to presents a threat to the livelihood, to the lives and safety of campesinos, the indigenous communities, as well as na neighboring countries. These are things that can be investigated from afar and apart from that there's or uh, connected to that there's a big operation to try to present or uh, to paint uh, Venezuela as a narco state despite the interior minister and a lot of other ministries coming up with very specific information such as geo, geo satellite tracking system information that shows that vessels are leaving Colombia and they're going to Europe 
or North America or other parts of the Caribbean, but completely bypassing Venezuela. We know this is a fact and we have that information and it needs to be exposed. It needs to be, um, it needs to be reported on. And these considerations would be of tremendous help, not only for debunking the myths around Venezuela, which is under attack right now, which is under siege with you know, US mil militarizing the Caribbean Sea, but it would also serve to you know, expand some of the myth debunking for Bolivia, where people have tried to paint the socialist government, uh, which was ousted, um, as a narco entity, despite really obvious information to the contrary. And another thing, uh, as I mentioned before, would be um, for people to spend a little bit of time um, looking through these different um, characters who have emerged in the Bolivian coup from those right-wing um, sectors, and in the case of Nicaragua and Venezuela, and figuring out what their funding sources are, what sort of activism are they really doing, if they have a foundation or an organization, if we see them speaking at the United Nations, who's sending them there and who's paying them, who's giving them a platform on the world stage and for what purpose. And so these are some of the things that I think we should be focusing on covering when we're not on the ground. Excellent, Camilla. Thank you very, very much for that contribution. Um, nicely you mentioned Oli Vargas. Of course, Oli spoke in our event two weeks ago on Bolivia, on the current situation there and on the coup there. Uh, we'll be posting that online um, if it hasn't gone online today, it'll be going online tomorrow. So do check that out and do subscribe to our YouTube channel. Um, let's not forget as well the, the Observer editorial, the, the so-called newspaper, The Guardian, obviously, The Guardian sister paper, um, supposedly the paper of the progressive left in Britain that uh, published an editorial shortly after the coup against Evo Morales in which it blamed Evo for the violence being committed by the coup regime against uh, indigenous pro-mass supporters. It also referred to the government, or sorry, the regime, I don't like to call them the government, of Janine Añez, the self-appointed president who won 4% in the election and which has recently cancelled elections uh, and is in a, in a, in a brazen power grab, uh, referred to her as the properly constituted interim government. That was in the Observer. So, you know, they have definitely played their part in legitimising the far-right coup in Bolivia. Uh, that has massacred indigenous supporters and shut down democratic processes. Um, moving on, I would like to invite John McAvoy to speak. Uh, again, John, a very late addition to the panel, but we're delighted to have him here. Uh, John, um, so John, John is an independent journalist who was reported from Colombia and Venezuela. He has also written about recent British involvement in Latin America in the International History Review, The Canary, Tribune and Jacobin. So over to you, John. Hi right, Nick, cheers for having us. Can everyone hear me? Yeah. Yeah, we can hear you. Thank you, Josie. Yeah, so I just wanted to start off um, with a quote on the media from Noam Chomsky, and then I'm going to apply that to various instances of reporting on Latin America, um, both in my experience of reporting from and on uh, the region. The quote is the basic principle, rarely violated, <clears throat> is that what conflicts with the requirements of power and privilege does not exist. I'm going to elaborate in four different ways on how this occurs with relation to Latin America. The first one is some uh, uncomfortable evidence or some uncomfortable facts simply do not exist. Now, uh, as some of you may know, I recently revealed the existence of a Venezuela reconstruction unit in the Foreign and Commonwealth Office uh, last month. Now, the evidence suggested uh, deep UK complicity in the coup process in Venezuela. Um, and it wasn't, this wasn't just news alone, this kind of initiated a diplomatic dispute between the Venezuelan Foreign Minister Jorge Ariadza and various members uh, of the UK, within the UK Embassy and the UK government. The UK government has recently been uh, accused of lying by the Venezuelan government in its response to this revelation. And now this made front page of, uh, of certain newspapers in Germany, um, obviously Russia Day and various outlets like that picked it up, but it simply did not exist in the UK mainstream press whatsoever. Now, this isn't an issue of resources whatsoever. In the time since this was uh, published, The Guardian has found time uh, to write an article about a stolen racehorse that was killed in Venezuela. So this isn't an issue about The Guardian's lack of resources or lack of personnel to cover what's going on there. This is a conscious decision of what to publish and what not to publish. Um, a similar case, uh, which was 
which came, I believe, back in August 2019, was a CEPR study about the impact of uh, sanctions on Venezuela, in which they found between 2017 and 2018, US sanctions, in which the UK is complicit, um, were responsible directly for 40,000 deaths in Venezuela in just the space of that year. Now, in the same period, the week after this, this story was published, and The Guardian never wrote a thing about it, The Guardian found the time to publish four separate stories on a supposedly uh, Russian spy beluga whale. And um, so you kind of get you kind of get a hierarchy of privileges, sorry, and priorities uh, in The Guardian of what constitutes news and what doesn't constitute news. And that's often aligned with what challenges power, uh, as uh, demonstrated in the quote by Chomsky. Now, the second principle uh, that's rarely violated is that successful alternative social and economic models simply do not exist in the media. Now, there's some quite serious uh, statistical case studies that, uh, that back this up. And between 1998 and 2008, uh, in Venezuela, the first 10 years, the first decade of uh, Hugo Chavez's presidency, most of the metrics for basic social and economic progress, uh, literacy, uh, malnutrition, poverty, etc., uh, were diminished. Um, it was a social and economic success story. And now in the BBC of 304 separate articles written about Venezuela in this period, only three of them actually reported on this social and economic success story. Now another similar case was in the first two years of the Sandinista government in Nicaragua. Now uh, Mark Curtis, uh, probably in my opinion the best historian in the UK, examined over 500 articles on Nicaragua in the FT, the Times and the Daily Te Telegraph. And it was a sim similar social and economic success story as Venezuela, uh, praised by Oxfam and various other international organizations. Now, between 1981 and 1983, only one in 500 articles in these outlets uh, even mentions these social and economic uh, metrics of progress, which, I mean, if you look at the statistics between 0.01 and 1% mentioning these metrics, you can see how much of the corporate press is structurally incapable of reporting accurately or fairly on these alternative uh, social uh, movements and governments. Uh, and the third principle is that some uncomfortable facts do not exist until their potency is totally lost. So until the knowledge of the facts becomes totally benign. Uh, one of the main reasons, well, one of the main ways in which this occurred uh, was on the 23rd of February, as many of you will recall, in Venezuela, uh, as the US tried to force humanitarian aid uh, in inverted commas, uh, trucks onto the Venezuelan uh, border. It made headline news uh, all across the US and the UK that elements of the Venezuelan government had set fire to aid trucks. And this added to the kind of atmosphere of total chaos, uh, kind of contempt for aid supposedly on the part of the Venezuelan government. Now, this was reported virtually at the time by Grey Zone that it was in fact mem members of the Venezuelan opposition and people on the Colombian side of the of the border that had set these Venezuela, sorry, these humanitarian aid trucks on fire. However, it took the New York Times an additional six weeks to report on the same evidence that the grey zone had actually used. At this time, the chaotic uh, scenes on the Venezuelan border were over and news of this actually occurring became effectively benign. So the New York Times in this case managed to maintain the facade of reporting critically on certain events while this critical reporting actually had no impact whatsoever on the on the events in question. Now a similar situation once again with the Liberal New York Times happened with the Bolivian election. Now just I believe this week they reported that in fact uh, the statistical analysis offered by the OAS uh, was was fraudulent itself. So the accusations of the OAS fraud within the Bolivian election were fraudulent themselves. Now once again we had evidence closer to the time once again offered by CEPR that the accusations of fraud against Abel Morales uh, were not actually founded in quantitative uh, evidence. However, it took the New York Times once again, this time eight months, eight months into uh, what can only be called now a dictatorship, uh, to actually report critically and factually on the evidence that existed much closer to the time. Uh, the fourth principle, uh, and the final one, is that uncomfortable facts only exist uh, when told by already discredited figures. Now, so the media spent the last decade or longer in some cases uh, demonizing and bastardizing figures like Hugo Chavez, Nicolas Maduro, uh, Dilma Rousseff, for example. Um, and once they're sufficiently demonized, 
then any evidence that comes from, or any factual evidence can be uh, offered from their mouths and is thus uh, dis in immediately discredited despite it being a fact in and of itself. Uh, so here's a direct quote from the BBC uh, last year. So the government accused opposition leader Juan Guaido of trying to topple President uh, Maduro after Mr Guaido called on the military to switch sides. Now the, the fact is actually contained within the sentence itself. Uh, it wasn't an attempted coup, but it only existed as a coup in the words of Maduro. So the idea that it is a coup is instantly discredited. Um, and just to finish off, the inverse is also true uh, within, the corporate, in, within the corporate media. So the US government systematically is systematically presented as a kind of credible source of information. So statements like US officials said or US intelligence says, uh, for example, that the Bolivian election was fraudulent, that is instantly um, presented as credible information, even though there is no factual uh, evidence to support it. So it's also true that the, inf in the inverse is true. If the US has said it, it's instantly uh, accepted as credible, whereas discredited figures in the US media um, are instantly presented as uh, totally discreditable, even if what they're saying is factually correct. Um, so what we can see, uh, to sum it up, is quite a, quite an incredible inversion of reality in many cases, in the case of Latin America especially, uh, as Matt said, uh, where you have some of the most hopeful social movements that we've seen in the past, uh, in the past half century, century longer. Um, and so this is why it's such a, such a focal point for uh, disinformation and misinformation within our media. Thanks a lot, John. And um, yeah, really, really, really uh, interesting and useful contribution. And of course, uh, really excellent work that you did recently uh, exposing um, Britain's kind of underhand manoeuvres uh, in relation to Venezuela. So our final speaker uh, is Pablo Navarrete. Pablo is a British Chilean journalist and documentary filmmaker. He's the founder and co-editor of Alborada uh, and director of Alborada Films, which has produced a number of documentaries and programmes on Latin America that have screened on television and at film festivals. He has made videos and spoken about contemporary Latin American political issues for various media outlets, including the BBC, Al Jazeera English, The Guardian, Navarra Media, and Mint Press News. So, Pablo, over to you. Thank you. Thanks, Nick. Uh, can everyone hear me? Yeah, great. Um, well, firstly, I just want to say that it's uh, great to uh, organise this panel with, with uh, these journalists who I've got a lot of respect for, uh, and good to see that we've got a really healthy number of people tuning in um so i'm going to be relatively brief because um with, with the addition of john um, i want to have enough time to get a good amount of kind of participation from people especially because we've got quite a lot of people to uh, on on the event i would rather than kind of try and offer um uh, kind of try and convince the public that the uh, mainstream media if you want to call it that the english language uh state-funded corporate media is uh, biased against left-wing governments. I uh, would say that it, it it is, and I would point people to perhaps uh, looking at, uh, as a kind of paradigmatic example, coverage of Venezuela uh, since Hugo Chavez came to power in 99, and how uh, the media has covered in that period Colombia, uh, a kind of right-wing uh, government that is funded to the tune, or has been and still is, funded to the tune of billions by the US government, uh, and also received uh, secret um, UK military training uh, and funding for a large part of that period. And I think that if one looks at the media coverage of those two countries, one can really get a sense of the priorities and uh, motivations that drive kind of corporate and uh, state-funded Western mainstream uh, coverage of the region. I think in there lies the key to understanding what's going on. So I think those are kind of extreme examples and I would kind of take in on what Matt has said, um, working on the ground, Camila's work on the ground, uh, John's work from Colombia and Venezuela, and my own experience of being on the ground in various countries and living and working as a journalist in Venezuela, I would say that uh, there is certainly a very striking disconnect between what one reads and hear, hears about these countries 
and what one or what one would see uh, in those countries. However, um, so rather than try and sort of offer you all these kind of examples, I'd say um, those two countries offer the, the, the method to understand it. Um, I would say that there is a, a really positive development of new media, independent media that challenges and offers the balance that, that is missing in the mainstream. And when I say the mainstream, I think there are, I mean, a lot of the speakers have spoken about uh, critically about The Guardian and, and obviously anyone that's heard me speak knows that uh, it's a theme very close to my heart. So I'm not going to kind of uh, expand on that. Um, but I would say that um, this, the, the Guardian and the New York Times in the US being the kind of left, most left wing on the spectrum of the political spectrum considered liberal or left wing, I think that they certainly, I would argue, have, have been at the forefront, in fact, of uh, smearing and misreporting governments such as Venezuela and Bolivia. And so when it comes to Latin America, there is really uh, not much that you can say, you know, there is very little difference uh, in, in the kind of ideological spectrum in terms of saying, oh, the, the Guardian has much better coverage than, say, the Times. If, if anything, it, it uh, plays a much more insidious uh, role. And I think the, the question then becomes, why is that? I mean, I think going back to what, uh, to what John said and, and quoting Chomsky, I wanted to, I had a one minute Chomsky clip, which I still think it would be good to end on as a means of maybe opening up uh, the discussion, which is an interview, uh, which I recommend people watch a half an hour interview with Andrew Marr, a kind of BBC, a very sort of celebrated BBC journalist. That, um, Andrew Ma uh, interviewed Chomsky in 1996 about the propaganda model, his kind of effectively his theory on how the media functions, which I think would find echo with a lot of what Matt has said and what John has said and Camilla as well, where he basically says that the, you know, the mainstream media, uh, its job is to deliver sort of audiences to subscribers. Uh, and that kind of explains uh, a lot about the type of reporting it does. I mean, I'm obviously I'm, I'm kind of simplifying it. Um, and that, you know, therefore the, the thought that it, that, that its real function is journalism is kind of, uh, misplaced uh, if we understand it in those terms. Now, um, I think it's also it, when asking why it is the case then that the media is not fit for purpose, I think we also have to recognize that, um, conversely, you know, outlets such as Telesur, which I'm a you know freelance collaborator on covering the UK, um, it's not the case that Telesur will, will, will engage in sort of massive critical exploration. Or, or the Venezuelan government. Um, and that has to, in the same way that perhaps it is not the case that Russia today uh, will do that when it comes to Russia, but it's certainly, I would say that the importance of journalism is about uh, getting an honest appreciation of the situation. Um, this talk of objectivity that, the, for example, the BBC uh, will hide behind is obviously, for example, given the statistics that John has shown, there are numerous examples how the BBC breaks its own sort of codes uh, on, on balance, on, on, on how it should be presenting information. So this idea that there is an objective uh, uh, way of uh, presenting information is false. I think that personally, I think the closest as a journalist, uh, the role of a journalist is to try and present the facts in the most honest manner that, that kind of gets to the, the truth of the, of the issue. And so I don't think it's a surprise to find that the BBC's output on Latin America shows a very, uh, shall we say, strong correlation to the foreign policy uh, priorities of the British government, which obviously, in the case of Latin America, is essentially a kind of satellite of the US, as it is with, with not only Latin America, to be honest. Um, so I think, um, so not only is there a kind of mass imbalance in how Latin America is reported, but there is also the imbalance created by censorship by omission, which is what isn't reported. So when Venezuela becomes the main uh, sort of dominates the news cycle on the humanitarian uh, sort of catastrophe, quote unquote, that um, is occurring there, and no one would deny that there is a very severe um, humanitarian issue. However, it is striking that no uh, similar week long or no, there was not a similar level of reporting on 
the thousands of, of, of people that have died in Colombia due to malnutrition or the hundreds of social leaders that have been murdered in recent years by, by again, right-wing governments and, again, funded by uh, the US government, funded by the British government, which you would think would give it a more uh, newsworthy, uh, would give it more newsworthiness, essentially. So I think, you know, these are the questions that I think mainstream journalists really have to answer. Um, and I think that there is, I mean, again, I don't want to come on here. I've worked for, I've made programs, for, uh, short programs for Al Jazeera English, who I think uh, is an interesting case because I think Al Jazeera English, you have both the best of journalism uh, in terms of uh, output in Latin America. You have programs that you could never get on, say, the BBC or on other mainstream channels, but you also have some awful uh, right-wing, unbalanced programs. So it goes to show that there are, while there are structures in place, I think there are uh, spaces that, as a journalist, um, I, have, I have taken a decision to look for uh, spaces to put my journalism out if I have editorial, a level of editorial control that I'm comfortable with. So I know others would say, given The Guardian's role, it's now something that has to be boycotted. I'm not convinced by that argument. I think we have to uh, crit critique what's wrong, um, build uh, an alternative, because we cannot expect The Guardian uh, essentially to offer, uh, to give Latin American left a fair hearing. Um, but we have to also be able to uh, use the platforms uh, when they're offered to us, but build the platforms that will be sustainable and credible for the long term. So I don't know, um, the censorship by omission uh, thing that I mentioned, I think is strike, I think is really interesting. And I think this clip that, we're, that, that hopefully we can show now, uh, for me speaks to a lot of why the mainstream covers Latin America in the way it does. It is because for example, in the case of the UK, 7% uh, of the people in the UK roughly go to private school, but they dominate the judiciary. They are of the leading journalists. They make up over 50%. They make up, I think, a third of uh, British MPs. So there is a class element to this. And, and, these, and it, so it's not that they are kind of perhaps have a hotline to say we need to smear Venezuela today. It is that these people have gone through an educational system which has ingrained certain ways of thinking and, um, and, and with that, I would say in the case of England, definitely, and the US even, is this kind of empire state of mind, uh, which is this kind of, oh, you know, the white journalist, uh, private school educated, going off to be a foreign correspondent and, and almost seeing it as a bit, bit of a jolly, it's kind of not very serious, um, you know, not speaking Spanish um, and almost bringing in this kind of arrogance and ignorance, which I think is that toxic mix that we get. Uh, the arrogance and the ignorance, and and I, and I'm always, and I always go back to that that time when um, the U.S. Uh, wanted to renew their, their military base in Ecuador near the beginning, I think, of, of Rafael Correa's uh, presidency, and he was and he said something along the lines of, "Sure, that's that's absolutely no problem as long as you guys can give us a military base in Florida," and you can imagine the, the reaction of, of the U.S. to that. And I think it's show. I think when one puts a mirror up to these situations you kind of see the hypocrisies uh, at play. So um, I think let, if we can, it'd be good to just finish on, on that little one minute clip uh, and then maybe, yeah, open up. Thanks a lot, Pablo. Um, another excellent contribution. I was brought up like a lot of people, um, probably post the Watergate film and so on, to believe that journalism was a crusading uh, craft and that there were a lot of um, disputatious, stroppy, difficult people in journalism. And I have to say, I think I know some of them. Well, I know some of the best and best known investigative reporters in the United States. I won't mention names, because I'm like, whose attitude toward the media is much more cynical than mine. In fact, <clears throat> they regard the media as a sham. And they know and they consciously talk about how they try to play it like a violin. If they see a little opening, they'll try to squeeze something in that ordinarily wouldn't make it through. Uh, and it's perfectly true that the majority, I'm, I'm sure you're speaking for the majority of journalists who are trained, have it driven into their heads, that this is a crusading a pre uh, profession, adversarial, we stand up against power, a very self-serving view. Uh, on the other hand, in my opinion, I hate to make a value judgment, but the better journalists, and in fact the ones who are often regarded as the best journalists, have quite a different picture. 
and I think a very realistic one. How, how, can, you, how can you know that I'm self-censoring? How can you I know that you're self-censoring? I'm sure you believe everything you're saying. But what I'm saying is if you believe something different, you wouldn't be sitting where you're sitting. Uh, a very revealing and uh, I think a succinct clip of Chomsky uh, to Andrew Marr, who obviously today is pretty much the BBC's main, uh, one of their main figureheads of news and information that we get. Um, so the questions are flooding in. Thanks again to all our contributors. Um, and thanks to everyone who's given a question. Um, before we go into that, I just want to say again, um, please support our Barada. I've posted the link in the chat and I will post it again at the end. Please get our digital magazine. I saw Pablo has also shared our list, uh, media directory list. Um, which is a list of grassroots independent media across Latin America, some in English and some in Spanish. So please click on that. And if you don't know those uh, outlets that are working at a grassroots level to really bring you news that has not been covered elsewhere, do check some of them out. They're really, really interesting. Um, now, we've had a few questions, and I suppose this is an issue that we can't avoid. Uh, it's the COVID-19 situation. We've had uh, questions from Tim Oxton, Pauline Fraser, and Yeji related to the COVID-19 pandemic and how the media has, um, or how governments uh, have uh, exploited the pandemic, uh, to what extent. Just for a, a little example I would like to give, uh, I was in Chile towards the end of last year and I was documenting and filming a lot of the protests that were going on uh, and the, the very, very heavy state repression that they encountered. Uh, the mainstream press, was absent on all these demonstrations. And it was grassroots journalists with mobile phones, with cameras who had documented the, the, the terrible human rights abuses uh, that, were, that were being beamed around Twitter, Facebook, um, and which very, very uh, condemned blatantly the right-wing government of Sebastian Piñera. Today, it's just been, uh, the news coming out of Chile today is that the government of Piñera who has been looking to clamp down on this independent grassroots journalist activism, uh, has passed a law that during the state of emergency imposed in response to the coronavirus, um, only journalists from mainstream outlets will have free passes in which they can travel freely without uh, fear of being detained or, or prevented from moving around by, um, by security forces and police. So that's just one example today, because one of the many groups, WhatsApp groups, I mean, was, was, was talking about it, uh, shows how governments are um, using the current situation to further their neoliberal or their anti-democratic agendas. Uh, I would like to just ask uh, our panel to summarize the questions that have come in. Perhaps they could react to how governments are using the coronavirus pandemic to further their agenda through the media. Um, perhaps I'll put that question to you first, Camilla. Okay, so obviously protests are starting back up and last night, uh, President Lenin Moreno extended uh, the state of exception for another 60 days. And during that 60 days, they plan to push even more austerity measures, which have included um, layoffs in the public sector and massive budget cuts to education. And these are all measures that the government attempted to push back in October when the massive protests took place. And the protests began in a place called Carchi in the north of Ecuador. Um, it did not begin here in Quito or in Guayaquil or any of the major cities. People were really angry about a number of things the government was doing. And it started in a very decentralized way. So I think that's really important for people to know that this was a very you know, uh, wide ranging uh, people's uprising against the government. And so of course, when those first uh, measures were announced, this was in October, um, these were of course measures that were, um, you know, for the IMF loan, uh, austerity measures that corresponded with that. And okay, so I'll wrap it up quickly, but um, it is really important to know that it was multiple sectors that rose up against the um, Lenin Moreno's IMF austerity. And because of that, a lot of that got shut down initially in October. But the media actually did parachute into Ecuador only after maybe the third or fourth day of protests when the indigenous movements came from um, other provinces and other 
uh, areas around Quito to Quito to join the protests. And they ended up leading the protests nationally, uh, th largely through Conai. And so, of course, um, that was a, in the end, those um, 10 to 14 days of protests um, in Quito, because of course the protest began before that outside of Quito, was seen as a victory for the indigenous movements in those communities. And so the government has been looking to bring those, those cuts in through various means um, until March when they saw their opening. And so as things are, uh, you know, they were beginning to try to reopen the economy, um, despite the disaster that was um, the COVID-19 crisis in Guayaquil and the large amount of cases and deaths we saw here that was um, with the health system completely um, unprepared. Now we're seeing another spike in cases um, and, a, and huge issues with the mayor of, of Quito saying we don't have sufficient beds, hospitals are at capacity. And just two or three weeks ago, the government actually laid off hospital workers, healthcare workers were just laid off because we thought we were over the peak. So people are losing their jobs. You're seeing more people than ever uh, outside begging for money, um, selling things that nobody needs to one another. Um, the situation is just as bad as it can possibly be. And now they will use the next 60 days of this extension of a state of exception to push even more austerity under which even more people will lose their jobs People are forced to lose 25% of their pay in the, in the, pu in the public education sector um, and other just absolutely disastrous measures that will have far-reaching effects um, while at the same time we hear rumors of a possible self-coup in the government and things such as that. Okay, thanks Camilla. Um... Yeah, another topic that we could talk for a very long time on, but we do have a lot of questions, so I'm going to move it on. Our next question is from Pauline Fraser, and I believe Pauline would like to ask the question herself, so we will get the camera on you, Pauline. Okay, right. Yeah, Pauline. <laughs> uh, yeah, can't quite see my questions, but it doesn't matter. Um, basically, it's about the way the media, uh, when, I, when I say media, the corporate media has... Um, used COVID-19 to attack um, Nicaragua, particularly um, the government of Nicaragua, over the way it's handled the um, COVID-19 crisis in that country. And I wonder if anyone has got com any comments about that. Um, and also, uh, just going back to the attempted coup, which was, you know, it was... Uh, almost touch and go at one time. It was, it was a really vicious attack on, on, on the Nicaraguan people. Um, and that, um, the involvement of outside um, supposedly, um, uh, what would you say? Um, NGOs? You know, good uh, organizations and NGOs of goodwill that they sound like nice, like Amnesty International, for example, and that that hoodwinked a lot of people on the left. I remember reading an article in Labour Briefing or something in which I wrote back about because it was so poor, because it was actually, you know, um, spouting the line of, um, uh, of um, okay, the, the right. opposition. Okay. Uh, Thanks a lot for your question. Uh, we'll put that question to Matt. Would you like to come in on that, Matt? I don't know if I'm the right person, to be honest, to, to answer that. I didn't I haven't really followed the situation in Nicaragua uh, with coronavirus. I don't know if anyone of the other. I think I think it's more about the um, the attempts to destabilise Nicaragua over the last couple of years. Uh, well, uh, what, what, what's been the media role, and what's okay. been the role? <laughs> well, of, uh, you mentioned. I mean. And it, yeah, exactly. Uh, NGOs play a, a vital role in this kind of tapestry of empire that we're talking about. So you have the institutions themselves uh, of the government, which are the DEA, the US military. Um, and in fact, how they like the system to work is that they're not introduced except at really critical points. But what they like to do is to use these kind of soft power institutions like NGOs and arm's length government institutions like National Endowment for Democracy to to give the appearance of a nice humming uh, pro-democratic system that it just happens to 
uh, work in the interests of US corporations and the US state. So, and NGOs, I mean, they play a vital role in it because, and this is an important point that Pablo made, which is, I think, one of the most important points about this part, how this whole system works. It's not even ideology, it's just about the milieu that you grow up in. So if you've gone through the educational systems and then enter a media system where everyone thinks a certain way, it's very, very hard to resist adopting that way of thinking. In fact, it's nearly impossible, I think. And I think that, that I saw it when I went to the Financial Times because I went in with journalists that were they, they were they were on the left, they were critically minded, they understood, they had they had good ideas about what journalism should do. And slowly you see them change. And it's not that they're th consciously doing it, it's just that everyone around them thinks a certain way. Everyone around them is respected as the most intelligent people in society. Uh, they're columnists for the Financial Times, they're, they're economics editors for the Financial Times. Why, why would you, wh how would you, how do you resist that and stay sane? I don't think it's possible. Um, and in fact, in the, in the case of the Financial Times, they have, one of the ways that they grind you down is they make you feel different. So I was called the maverick and uh, immature. And there's a whole, there's a whole roster of, of ways that they make you feel like an outsider and that you're stupid if you don't adopt the mainstream thinking. And I think that um, that exists for NGOs as well. In fact, it exists across the whole of society. And this is a problem with the reporting is that you, these people are flown in from London or New York. They they arrive in these in, in Caracas. They instantly go out and meet with a really rich uh, uh, head of an NGO who's part of the whole uh, uh, elite of that country. They then go and interview a businessman who's part of the same elite. And the whole of their milieu, the whole of their construction of reality is from a certain viewpoint, which is the elite. And then they'll go, they'll, obviously they they'll, will, will then go to the barrios, but that, those, bar those quotes will be framed by the worldview of the elite. So, that's the, so we get this whole, that, that's how the whole system hums along. And of course, this is what the media should be doing is deconstructing the propaganda and NGOs and NED and all these other uh, organizations that say that they're doing uh, good things. The role that we should have as journalists is, and being independent is to kind of pick apart. Is that true? Is the National Endowment for Democracy really about um, uh, uh, democracy? Are, are Oxfam uh, America really about development? Are they, are, are, is the World Bank really about poverty alleviation? And pretty much to a penny, if you start looking to it and, 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 and avoid the, the propaganda that's put out across the board, you'll realize that pretty much the invert, it's the inversion of reality of all of them. NED is set up to stop democracy. The World Bank is, in fact, one of the main reasons poverty still exists across Latin America and the world. It's, all, it's, it's, it's what Eduardo Galeano called the upside down world. But it's very hard, you have to, to have a rational perspective of the system, you have to be completely outside it. That's my point of view. That's why when Pablo talks about why is The Guardian so bad now, The Guardian is, is structurally, its role is to be bad on Latin America because its role is to destroy the idea that there can be an alternative. It's the interna internationalization of what they did to Corbyn. They, 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 their role is to guard the left extreme and to make sure that liberation politics cannot exist. And um, I, I think that um, the, in the case of Nicaragua, uh, uh, obviously that, that happened, but it's, it's, it's a case across the board with all the, with, all the, um, with all the liberation movements. And particularly, I saw it in Bolivia because in Bolivia I spent a month soon after 2008 when there was the very real possibility of uh, a civil war because there were all these uh, strikes in the East. Um, and it was actually quite similar to what they tried, what they did to Allende. There was trucker strikes and also they tried to bring the, the government down through make it, basically making, making the country stop working. And after that, you, you saw with Evo what, how the system works. When I was there, I really, it really was a kind of formative experience because it's very hard to understand systems when they're running well because you can't see the pressure points. But when you get someone who completely upsets that system, you start seeing those pressure points. So you start seeing that actually, wow, Evo's kicking out the DEA. He's kicking out USAID. He's really uh, trying to uh, make the country independent. And that really flipped 
a lot of a lot of stuff for me. It made me understand that actually, if you want if you want to be uh, a liberate independent and actually actually do good for your for your people, there's no way you can do it within the framework that's been set by the imperial power up north. It's just impossible. So um, and the end and the NGOs are are are, are, a, are a vital part in that and one that we should as journalists be analysing all the time because it's also goes to this point of the imbalance of power because if you're a journalist i don't know for the guardian right you're covering a, i don't know a story about bolivia you want quotes you want information there's a whole industry on the right that can feed you information that can feed you quotes there's tons of ngos that are probably down the line are somewhere funded by western governments there's tons of consultants in washington dc there's tons of human rights groups there's tons of u.s government um institutions that will freely give you information and are set up to, 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 to skew the debate their direction. On the other side, there's hardly any infrastructure because there's no money there. So you have this complete imbalance of power, which is another reason that the, the coverage is so skewed because, and in fact, this isn't in Latin America, but you see it a lot with Israel-Palestine, that you literally, the Palestinians are completely voiceless because they have no infrastructure that's developed to give their voice in the media. Whereas on the other side, it's one of the most sophisticated operations in the world. So uh, it's the same in, in Latin America. And I think that, 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 that was, that's why Hugo Chavez started Telezor with other um, left governments, because they understand that information uh, operations are vital or getting information out that counters the narratives put out by Western media is vital to maintaining power because if you if you have populations in the West that have been just bombarded with misinformation about governments, it's going to be it's much easier for them to take to take them out. And you see that with Venezuela now. I mean, the coverage, as I said earlier, it should be on the international page. It should be it, sh it should be terrorist attack on on Venezuela. The, the terms should be, but they're not because you have a whole industry which is feeding information to the media and then to the population, which just makes it seem like it's okay that this happens because it's understood that Venezuela can't be a sovereign country. It's understood that the US wants to get rid of uh, Maduro because it wants freedom and democracy for Venezuela. These are all, these are all just deeply embedded uh, ideological facts that have been created by a framework of institutions, which includes NGOs and which includes government institutions and which includes the media. Thank you very much, Matt. Our next question is from John Perry, and I believe John is going to read the question himself. So you can get the camera on, John, please. Yes. Um, Hi, John. Question. Hi there. Um, I'm based in Nicaragua, and I, I do write sometimes for the Grey Zone and for Counterpunch, trying to um, put a, a progressive view about what's happening in, in Nicaragua and countering the likes to The Guardian, BBC, and so on. One of the most de depressing um, experiences is to find how divided the left is uh, on this issue and indeed uh, uh, the same applies on, on other Latin American countries and my question is how do we try to get the left uh, to be more progressive how do we get them to see uh, that they should be skeptical about the Guardian BBC New York Times and so forth and indeed be more skeptical about whatever they read anywhere because they do lap up what essentially is right-wing propaganda. Thank you very much, John. Uh, Pablo, would you like to come in on that? I mean, I mean, earlier I spoke about the kind of issue of uh, class, essentially, and how, sort of, at least in the case of Britain, the, the British class system serves as a, as a kind of filter that, that kind of puts people like Andrew Marr in a position where he thinks he's a crusading journalist but essentially he doesn't really understand what Chomsky is telling him. And then in 2003, after the Britain invades uh, illegally Iraq, he stands outside Downing Street, extolling sort of almost like semi-orgasmic over Tony Blair, uh, Tony Blair's uh, as a prime minister. And so I think that there's an issue of class in the mainstream, which I think is at least certainly in the case of Britain, uh, explains a lot. Um, but I think um, on what, if we're talking about the left, I mean, if we're talking uh, what, what is kind of the, the, the really existing left um, media in somewhere like the UK, um, I think uh, obviously the coverage of Latin America in independent media outlets can also be kind of divided between uh, sort of, uh, I guess on the one side, you've got more sort of stridently left wing uh, 
outlets such as the Canary, and then you and you've got others such as Novara, who I actually say think that do a, a kind of really good job, uh, but who on on issues of, of Latin America kind of have often taken a very cautious. Let's put it. We can say that in a if we put if euphemistically cautious uh, uh, and slightly um, a clumsy uh, way of covering it. And, and I would argue that the issue of class is also a factor uh, in there, there as well. I think the, the, there is, um, especially the, the Corbyn moment that began in 2015, uh, there were re-energized sort of the British left. And I think it served as a massive political uh, education for vast swathes of, of the UK uh, society. But I also think that um, some of the reasons why there was a lack of uh, courage uh, or there was a lack of propensity to defend certain principles was because the people in the positions perhaps came from a, a certain class that was alien, that was removed from the, sort of from the kind of nitty gritty of, of the class struggle. And so for them, it was fine to say, for example, on, on Venezuela, uh, Nima, well, you know, Victor Jara has a song called Ni Chicha Ni Limona, um, no to Maduro, no to US imperialism. They're kind of these kind of abstract positions that are, are kind of fine to have on, in a theoretical sense. But when you are uh, in Venezuela, uh, you know, and you're being attacked by US imperialism and US sanctions are, are kind of, you know, killing people, um, I think that the, the, the kind of positions of uh, perhaps outlets such as Jacobin have shown on Brazil have been in the run-up to the coup, where you know there seemed to be a kind of lit litany of anti-Lula, um, Lula articles, anti-Dilma articles that fed into this narrative of a kind of a justifiable uprising. Um, uh, so I think that how do we how do we? I think it's about education. It's about, uh, but it's also about um, you know uh, class, and I think it's about uh, putting more uh, working-class voices. Uh, in, in control of the media, voices that are invested in, in social processes and perhaps uh, do not see things purely in theoretical uh, terms. Thanks very much, Pablo. Um, we've had a couple of questions relating to Brazil. Obviously, Brazil has had a very tumultuous few years, uh, culminating in the nightmare situation that it has now with a government that is completely, completely reckless with the health of the population, um, with its treatment of indigenous communities uh, and so forth. Um, so Rupert asks, um, I was wondering about your opinions, your opinions on the Guardian's coverage of Brazil. It seems that they've been largely critical of Bolsonaro's government, but do you think they've gone far enough? And Natalia also, uh, who I believe is a contributor at Brazil Wire, the excellent uh, English language website, check them out if you haven't done before. Um, why has the UK and US press not acknowledged the role of the US Department of Justice in the scandal um, which led to the coup uh, against Dilma Rousseff and ultimately the jailing of Lula da Silva, which removed him from the election that he would have won and saw Bolsonaro uh, take power? I mean, we, we, we were sure there would be a lot less people uh, would have died of coronavirus with a Workers' Party government. So, John, perhaps I could come in on you here and just uh, invite you to discuss a little bit on Brazil, knowing that you've worked recently uh, with Brazil Wire and done some coverage there. Yeah, so to, re to respond to the, the latter question first about um, why there's been so little coverage about US involvement in the kind of coup processes that occurred in Brazil, um, not only the impeachment of uh, Dilma Rousseff, but also the jailing of, uh, of Lula. Well, that, that once again fits into the uncomfortable facts uh, that basically don't, don't exist um, for as long as they're potent. So the, with, with the issue of, um, of, the, of the coup in Brazil, at the time the evidence was available, as Brazil Wire has showed, uh, that the US State Department was involved uh, with the coup in uh, Brazil. However, uh, this, this, I mean, this evidence hasn't been even uh, acknowledged whatsoever by The Guardian. Uh, it's only recently been acknowledged by The Intercept uh, based on more recent leaks, even though the evidence was uh, previously available. Um, so, I mean, obviously the most impact you can actually have on policy is from the country within which it occurs. 
Um, and that's why most media never actually report on the impacts and the influence uh, and the involvement that their own country is having in countries over the world, because if they were to do it, it might actually have a discernible impact on power. Um, and what might have a discernible impact on power usually doesn't actually exist whatsoever. So, um, I mean, that's, that's one, of the, one of the main issues. I mean, another, another issue is I think The Guardian is just simply, um, in many regards, quite incompetent in its reporting on Latin America. They often get, uh, they often get facts wrong. Um, they often just uh, uh, totally disregard most context, especially of US involvement in the region over the past half um, a century. Um, yeah, so that'd be my, my brief answer to that. Thanks a lot, John. Okay, so we have got uh, around 10 minutes, so hopefully time for a uh, couple of questions. Um, Sequoia had a question. Uh, how important is this myth of inherent Western humanitarianism? And to what extent does the language of human rights versus authoritarianism shape people's views and their actions? So I would like to get back to everyone else. So if you could just try and ask these questions relatively briefly so that everyone gets another chance to to speak um i will uh, put that question to pablo first human rights versus authoritarianism and the discourse uh, that is presented to us through the mainstream media uh just very quickly i think i'd, I'd kind of link it to what's happening in the uk recently with the, with the kind of bringing down of stat statues associated with the U with the uk sort of slave trade imperialism i think there's such a lack of uh, and john spoke about this this kind of how the media basically negates uh, the Britain's uh, role in the past and in the present in terms of sort of crimes, basically crimes, slavery. And so people don't have uh, uh, basically a proper understanding of the type of government that the UK has been and continues to be. It doesn't understand that the UK has stolen a billion dollars uh, worth of gold that, that belongs to the Venezuelan government. And this won't appear in a Guardian article decrying how Venezuela is, a, you know, in the 10th Guardian article or whatever, 10th New York Times article of the month decrying the, the kind of disaster uh, engulfing Venezuela. This kind of contextual uh, information, which is very important and germane to any type of analysis, will be completely omitted. So I think, again, it's about, um, uh, unfortunately, people, it's a lack of, uh, the media are not fit for purpose and they're not providing the people with the uh, basic information that they need in order to understand what's going on in the world around them. And I think, uh, yeah, that's essentially the, the case. And I think that's why it's so welcoming to see that there seems to be the, the, the murder of, of George Floyd in the US has kind of triggered this movement where people are kind of uh, almost, I mean, I think people have learned more about the, uh, the slave owner that was, uh, learned more about the British Empire in the last week uh, than they would, uh, you know, reading the British media for the last 20 years, perhaps. Um, so yeah, it's about education um, for me. Thanks, Pablo. Our next question comes from uh, Slava Zilber. Uh, Slava has a recent piece that he did with, um, with the US economist, Richard Wolf, which is on the Alvarado website. Um, so could you, uh, blah, 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 blah. So how do you avoid covering Latin America on, oh, oh, I think Slava's here. Okay, great, he can read it himself. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. How do you avoid covering Latin America on the terms corporate media and right-wing governments prefer, for example, talking about the state of democracy in Venezuela or Nicaragua instead of, of the interest in exploiting the country's resources? And how would you respond to expatriates telling you we're concerned about democracy in their country and to, we are in favor of regime change. Thank you very much. Um, we'll put that question to Camilla. So just to summarize again, um, how do you shift the, the focus, uh, the, the, the terms of debate uh, from what the corporate media and right-wing governments prefer towards a more progressive focus? And what would you tell expatriates of, I assume, countries like Venezuela, uh, who insist they are concerned about the lack of democracy in their country and that they support regime change against their, the governments of their own countries. Okay, 
hopefully you guys can hear me now. Yes, we can hear um, you. I think it's, it kind of ties in with the last question of this kind of myth of humanitarianism and human rights versus authoritarianism. Like we're seeing right now amid COVID-19 that the United States went out of its way to block necessary equipment and medical supplies to the very countries which it's supposed to support, to the very countries which essentially have been its colonies. And so not only are they blockading Venezuela, blockading uh, for decades and decades Cuba, and also attacking other countries like those countries that are associated with Venezuela, which are the CARICOM, small uh, Caribbean island nations, but they're also not providing assistance to their own uh, to their own allies that are supposed to be, you know, their foot soldiers on this continent. So I think, um, you know, we really need to expose the way in which the United States and the global north causes, um, you know, harm to everybody, not just its enemies. And um, <clears throat> and I think, like, going back to, to what Pablo just said, people don't know the extent of the crimes of the, of the UK state. Well, people also don't know the extent of the crimes of of countries like Canada. So it's especially now when the Canada is, you know, upon the orders of, of Washington demanding a seat on the UN Security Council in order to carry out these imperialist crimes, it's really important to denounce what those are. And so people, you know, so that we're able to expose what's going on in different parts of the world. But um, yeah, obviously, like, humanitarian aid is largely fake. Everything that um, you say and all these other uh, groups do in the global south is obviously not for our benefit and so we just have to um, continue exposing that that is the job of journalists thanks Camilla okay um, we've got a question from David Raby so uh, David is going to ask the question himself hello yes Hi, David. Um, yes um, there is um, an issue which I think um, is not so obvious, but it is that um, the media, the corporate media, tend to systematically ignore um, interesting and progressive developments in Latin America until they reach crisis point. Um, and they rely on the ignorance that people have to be able then to impose their own viewpoint. I'm thinking in particular of the fact that um, within the last year and a half, um, two countries in Latin America, two major countries, have elected quite progressive governments, Mexico and Argentina. But you will find nothing about them in the mainstream media, or you'll find very um, passing references to how they're handling the COVID-19 crisis or something like this. But these are very interesting developments which could be extremely relevant in the next couple of years. What do we do about this? Okay, so going to pass that question to John, and then I will invite Matt to follow up on John as well. So, uh, John, if you'd like, if you've got any comments on that, yeah, of course. I mean, it's just a it's just a basic um, issue of reporting on the history of these countries. Um, my my main experience of this was when I was in Venezuela. Um, obviously, I was experiencing a, a severe political and economic crisis at the time. And people looking from the outside, it was totally incomprehensible that people would once again go into the streets um, or there'd be, there'd be people willing to, to defend uh, the legitimacy and the sovereignty of their state and their government. This made absolutely zero sense to them whatsoever. Um, so, I mean, it's not, even, it's not even the process prior to these coups happening or internal crises. It's also if you can actually get to the places at the time and... Um, kind of explain the ways in which people are willing to kind of defend governments, even in crisis, uh, that have actually served them well. I mean, especially in the case of Venezuela, it was centuries of oppression for many, um, many sections of the population, which under Chavez finally had, had a voice, were, um, were except, well, could, could go to, their children could go to school, they could visit a hospital. Um, and this, this, these kind of things are, needs to be explained by journalists, especially independent journalists who go to the country during the period of crisis so they can understand why, uh, you know, these populations aren't just this kind of auto uh, mindless automaton that they're, they're depicted as in the corporate media, but they're actually, you know, there's, there's a historical process that is much more complex and it can be explained to people at the time. Thanks a lot, John. So um, 
I'm going to pass this question over to Matt just to say that Matt and I were both in Buenos Aires uh, in early December, uh, the day that the uh, new government that David refers to took over. And it was a very lively uh, day. It was about 34 degrees and there was about 2 million people on the streets of Buenos Aires. It was really quite something. Um, so Matt, yeah, I'd like to just pass that question over to you then. Um, yeah, I guess it, it relates, I mean, it, it kind of relates to everything we've been talking about. I think on the whole humanitarianism v authoritarianism, um, there's a, there is a simple rule for how you will be covered in the Western media, corporate media, mainstream media, if you're, a, if you're a government in Latin America. If you're nice to corporations, nice to international capital, you'll get good write-ups. It's quite simple. It doesn't matter what you do, you will get good write-ups. Um, Lula was an interesting case in the Pink Tide because he actually was not demonized by the media. And that was because his model was different to Bolivia and Venezuela. He wasn't actually upsetting capital in the same way as them. And then you had, and, and the Western media was quite happy to promote him. I mean, I, I, I'm a fan of it, don't get me wrong, but, there was, but he was definitely a kind of golden child of the Western media for parts of it. And in fact, Obama said he's his favorite president in the world or something along those lines of that. So, I mean, that is the rule. Everything else is ideology. Now, that ideology has been there since the dawn of uh, the elite media. I actually disagree with Pablo. I think we can't, we can't deal with that. It's set up. It's like saying, which, let's try and reform the National Endowment for Democracy or something. I, don't, I think the corporate media is set up to spread misinformation, disinformation. The way to, the way to uh, get around that is to, boy, one, boycott it, if you're a journalist, and two, build up alternatives, because it's a long-term project, but that will be what changes the game. Holding on to the idea that at some stage, the corporate media might cover Latin America in an okay way, or might cover the rest of the world in an okay way, it's not going to happen. Think about like Honduras, I mean, these, most of these countries in Central America and in other parts of Latin America, there's like three oligarchs that own the whole media. The idea that you can appeal to their good sense that maybe we'll, they'll may, maybe write something truthful about liberation movements which threaten their power, I don't buy it. So I think what we need to do is what Camilla was saying, do what journalists are meant to do. Try and lift the, up the veil of ideology, which is just so potent. But, I, but understand that that's how the system works and don't try and think that it's ever going to be different. The way to do it is to build our own our own infrastructure and our own media. And secondly, if you're a leader of one of these countries, just don't worry about it. Because at the end of the day, do you think that, that after the Cuban revolution, they were ever going to get, and they were nationalizing all these companies and they were stepping on the toes of international capital like that. Do you think they would ever get a good write up? It's not going to happen. So in some ways, I think that in terms of survival mechanisms and planning for, for liberation movements to survive, it's more about what you do domestically to shore up your uh, to shore up the people because of course if if you're if you're worth your soul as a as a liberation leader you should be progressing society in a way that brings a lot of people in so come up with ways where they can uh, resist uh, the the imperial forces that will inevitably come and I think that in the case of Allende he didn't do that and I think I don't, I don't really know too much about what what happened in Bolivia because there was talk at the time that there was um, that they had like, people's militias and I know that's happened in Venezuela but I think that there is to some degree if you're one of those people there you've got to not really worry about the, what the international media is saying our job obviously is to try and influence it because and to, to provide alternatives because we're here but if you're there I don't think you're ever going to get a fair hearing in corporate media as a conclusion tear down the whole edifice build something better um, get truthful information out and then we'll ride off into the socialist sunset Okay, well, uh, a, a very nice, uh, yeah, a very nice closing sentiment. Um, I think on that note, I will offer a final word to Pablo. Unfortunately, we don't have time for any more questions. Uh, it's been a brilliant event. Obviously, this is somewhere, something we can talk on and on about, but we will organise more events. Um, Pablo, would you like to just uh, summarise and, and mm. offer a few closing words? Mm. I mean, I don't really want to... I mean, I think that there's definitely further things to, to argue vis-a-vis, -vis, you know, how we engage with entities such as The Guardian, uh, but definitely, I think what, um, what I think we'd all agree on is the absolute necessity of building alternative independent media that can um, kind of challenge these hegemonic narratives that are, are kind of put out there on Latin America, which are enemies of progressive movements, ultimately. And I think, yeah, I think we have to look at ways of working together, of supporting each other, of uh, building uh, 
yeah, building platforms that can that can kind of uh, affect people's consciousness and and kind of get to and to do the journalism which which the mainstream and and so much of the corporate Western media is uh, not fit for purpose to do. And so, basically, what I'm saying is support Al Borah's fundraising. <laughs> <laughs> uh, is the you can't get a more beautiful closing line than that. So um, yeah, all right. Well, everybody, thank you so so much for your wonderful contributions. It was a really really uh, great uh, and informative and interesting talk. Your four journalists who I admire very much. I've worked with Pablo and with Matt in the past several times. Uh, very much hope to be able to work with John and with Camilla in some form in the future. Um, we will post everybody's Twitter uh, and any other links to their work. Um, we will post in the chat. So please do follow everybody uh, who's participated. I will, as Pablo said, support Alborada. These events, they do cost us to put on and we do want to expand. And you've just heard why uh, the likes of Alborada are so important. So please do support us, even if it's a pound a month, but you know, if it's more, that's great. But you know, that really, really does make a difference and will allow us to expand and to keep challenging these dominant narratives. Uh, also do get hold of our digital magazine. I will repost the link there. So with that, once again, thanks to all our speakers. We will leave the chat room open for about 15 minutes. So feel free to keep chatting. Uh, we will still be around. And we hope to see you soon. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.